2018 Committee on Aging meeting to order. Roll call, please. Peggy Bellin is excused. Claude Benedict. Here. Lurton Blassingame. Here. Sue Ashton. Zandy Kleckel. Excused. Judy Ritchie. Here. Julie Moslowski. Here. Deb Allison Osby. Jean Wallerman. Here. Ron Durkot. Here. Okay. Each of you have been uh, sent a copy of the minutes from our uh, August meeting. Do we have any additions or corrections? Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Citizen statements. We have Aaron. Okay. Uh, then moving on, new business, Jean Tondrick, uh, Time of Your Life Expo. Jean, we'll have you take the podium over there okay. and give your name and your address, please. Name and what? Address. Oh. Jean Tondrick, 1155 Algoma Boulevard, Oshkosh. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the upcoming third annual Time of Your Life Senior Expo taking place Tuesday, October 2nd, from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Oshkosh Convention Center. The first hour, uh, we have coffee and light breakfast at the opening. And uh, we have many health screenings, presenters, and uh, approximately 80 plus vendors in the senior market. We expect about 700 attendees, as we've had the last couple years. We always have a keynote speaker, and uh, this year she is Kate, I'm sorry, um, Becky Abramson. Here, I have it right here. Becky Abramson. She is the executive director of the Wisconsin Institute for Healthy Aging. She's coming from Madison. This agency is a nonprofit devoted to research and dissemination of evidence-based health promotion interventions in healthy aging. Her talk is titled, Ageism is Bad for Everyone's Health. She's going to provide the definition of ageism, its origins, the historical context types and examples of ageism, of this insidious ism that permeates our youth-based society. This should be very interesting. Yeah. She's all, they've also started a movement called 7.5, and we'll have pins and cards about that. It is proven that a person who is mentally alert, um, moving around, engaged in their community, lives 7.5 years longer than their counterparts. So that's exciting. We also are doing something different this year. We have Kate Bookness from Catherine's Auction and Appraisal Service out of Little Shoot Kimberly area. Mm -hmm. She is going to be doing an appraisal, uh, two periods of about 100 each. She'll be able to take about 100. So we're inviting attendees to bring one item of property that they might have around the house. It doesn't have to be an antique. but Grandma's old clock or uh, a special ant uh, old pie tin or something. I'm just throwing something out. But um, so attendees are invited to bring that. We're going to be able to do about 100 from 8.30 to 10, about an hour and a half, and then again 12 to 1.30. Beginning of the conference uh, show, end of the show. So this is the first time, so we're seeing how that goes. but. I think it should be quite interesting. Um, we also have health screenings. Uh, Walgreens will be providing their flu clinic, and they also are able to do uh, some pneumonia vaccines. If someone asks, they can look up on a state registry to see if somebody has it, um, so can, they can help out with that as well. Uh, we always do the blood pressure, pulse and respirations, and uh, they all fill in. We have, we're gonna have more filling in. Um, oh, 
um, hearing screening is Avada Hearing will be doing a hearing screening, and OptiVision will be doing the eye screening. But we'll have some more filling in. Um, we have we have also presenters in the meeting rooms along uh, the side of the convention center. Allison Wendell from Options for Independent Living will be uh, coming in. Option, and this is their first time. Options for Independent Living will highlight their assistive technology services, including a discussion about TEP, the tele telecommunication equipment purchase program and how to find the right amplified phone for you. I didn't realize it, but there are several different ones. They also, up in Appleton, have a home outfitted to show and tell the right equipment for home safety. Isn't that interesting? You can take somebody up to Appleton, go through a home, and try different uh, equipment. They also have a lend closet, not only for hearing equipment, but other medical equipment. Joe McClear uh, is a new attorney to Oshkosh, and he specializes in estate planning and elder law. He will talk about long-term care options in the Oshkosh area and what seniors can do to prepare for this growing cost of care. Topics discussed will include long-term care insurance, Medicaid eligibility, special benefits for veterans, and why putting your house in your children's names is a terrible idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Kate Bookness, uh, the um, auctioneer and appraiser, is also going to be speaking about uh, decluttering. She specializes in working with clients wishing to downsize their f homes and works with them and their families and is always willing to offer her expertise in those special, uh, stressful times. We have um, Lakeview Memorial Park is going to be speaking on funeral planning and the latest on that, I guess. And then we have Ellen Kosky from the Fox Valley Advanced Care and Planning Partnership. This is her first time with us too. And she's going to be speaking on advanced directives. So. I hope that covers it. Any questions? Jean, you're a, a member of the Neighborhood Association. Have you shared this with the other 15, other 16 neighborhoods? No, that's a good idea. Please do. Uh, yep, get that email out there. Mm -hmm. e either that, because you gave us a lot of information, yes. or do what you've done f to, for us at the next meeting. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And we, uh, as Committee on Aging, we have been very kindly offered to have a small space of our own to promote the committee and what we're doing. So we're really looking forward to that. And, Good. Um, I had to do that. I've been working with Jean on the, and our other Jean on the planning committee. So lots of good things coming with that. So thank you. Yes, I'm very grateful for uh, my community partnership of the Oshkosh Senior Center, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, United Way, and the Winnebago County Health Department. The four of them have been outstanding in their help, and then Judy was asked to come as well because of all of her knowledge. So I, I appreciate everybody's help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And our next speaker is Kate Mann, the Oshkosh Police Department. <laughs> Hello, thanks for having me today. So we're gonna go over a couple of different things. I have two different PowerPoints. Can you guys hear me mm -hmm. yep. loud enough? Okay. <laughs> so the first one we're gonna go over is how to avoid scams and identity theft. Have you guys ever dealt with getting a scam email or a scam phone call? Me too. They even call me on my work phone too. My work cell phone, my work landline. Like, the police department, are you sure you want to keep talking to me about this? <laughs> they call everybody. 
So what is a scam? People are trying to get your money. So they can do this in many different ways. There is lottery scams, and that's in some of the paperwork that I handed out. The one that says, you won the lottery from Spain. And like, hmm, I don't think I entered the lottery of the world in Spain. And you get millions of dollars, but there's a catch. You have to send 10% of this money before you get it to Estrella Servos in, looks like Spain. And make sure that you list all of your important information here, like your bank routing number, your date of birth, um, you know, everything that you would need to take your money. Hmm. So that sounds like a good idea. But these are actually letters that people in Oshkosh have received. Hmm. And it looks good, right? Like, yeah, one million dollars, but it's not. So uh, lottery scams, phone scams, we all get those. Have you guys heard of romance scams? Yeah, catfishing, they call it. Mm -hmm. Email scams, which I get to my work email and letters in the mail. <clears throat> so we talked about the, the lottery scam. So anything that says you've won money in a contest you haven't been in, that you have to pay money first probably is not legitimate. Phone scams. So have you guys heard of them spoofing numbers before? Yeah, so it's interesting because my cell phone is from Milwaukee. It's a Milwaukee area code. So all the phone calls I get are from oh, Milwaukee. That's weird because they'll look at your area code, they'll spoof a number, and then call from it. So you know, if I still live in Milwaukee, oh, well, it might be a legitimate phone call from somebody at the bank or a neighbor or something. And you'll see that on your 920 home phones or your cell phones. You'll see a lot from Oshkosh. Oh, it must be legit. It's from my hometown. Hmm, no. So they can take whatever number they want and spoof it, like plug in what number they want to show up on your phone. So it'd be nice if it says, like, scam likely when you're getting that phone call, right? But, I mean, if you're getting a phone call from a different country, do you know anybody in that country? If you don't, I wouldn't answer. Have you guys heard of the grandparent scam? Have you guys gotten any of those? Oh, yeah. Calls? Yes, yes, yes. Want to tell me what that phone call looks like? Sure. They call up and say, uh, this is your grandson, and I'm at an accident, and so on. That's why I don't sound the same, because I hurt my nose, and, <laughs> yeah. and so on. And, We've found that because we have nicknames for our grandsons, we ask them if, give me your nickname. And, mm -hmm. and click, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or another way to, I always tell people, verify. So if your grandson is supposedly in Mexico, then maybe call a relative of the grandson that would know, like, hey, is he in Mexico? Or call him. <laughs> and if he picks up, well, says, nope, I'm at school right now, everything's fine, you know, versus going out and immediately doing what they want. And a lot of them will ask you to go and buy gift cards. Have you guys heard of that? Like iTunes, all different kinds of gift cards. Because then once you give them the number over the phone, they have all the information that they need to use. So that should send a red flag too. Like why would they need gift cards? That's weird. But it's, it's surprising how many people will actually go out and, and buy them. So here's the romance scam, the catfishing as they call it. So you meet on a dating site. You don't know who this person is, but you're you know talking a lot and maybe suddenly you're falling in love and then guess what they want from you? <laughs> Money. I really love you, honey. Please send me $5,000. Hmm. Okay. I don't know you at all. I mean, would you go up to some random person on the street and be like, Hey, you know, here's all my information and here's five thousand dollars. Because I trust you, right? I know who you are now. And really you have no idea. How to avoid scams. Don't give your information out. And sometimes they are tricky. So we bought a car recently and uh, through Wells Fargo. So you got a phone call from Wells Fargo, but it was at like nine o'clock at night. Hey, we see that you just purchased your car, you want to set up some automatic payments, I just need all of your banking information. So a couple red flags should pop up. Why are they calling me at 9 o'clock at night? 
And yeah, it makes sense. We do have a, a car loan through Wells Fargo now, but do I know that this person is actually from Wells Fargo? So I guess what are some options that you could do to make sure it's Wells Fargo that's calling you? Call Wells Fargo the next morning. Exactly, because <laughs> you're going to have all the information. Yeah. That sure. Because yeah. then you can confirm that they're the ones who are actually calling. Or say, you know, send me the information in the mail and I'll look it over. So identity theft, just getting all of your information, the big ones, social security number, your bank information, name, date of birth. There was a tricky one too. <clears throat> so uh, they were resetting out the Medicare cards. Mm. And I was starting to get some phone calls from citizens. Hey, these are some calls that we're getting. So I called Medicare and they said, yeah, we will not be calling people. We will be mailing it to them. So one lady got a phone call and was like, okay, I'm just gonna confirm the information on your card. And it had some of the information, but had the wrong date of birth. So thinking ahead, the lady's like, well, I'm not gonna tell them my correct information. I don't know who these people are. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna call them the next day or, or whatnot. So don't give out any information, no matter how small it may seem. So protect the information, get the, the credit report. You can review and see what credit cards you have out there. You might be surprised you forgot about a credit card that you opened years ago. Or, you know, maybe back in college, you have all those promos like, hey, sign up for these credit cards, and you forget about them, like, oh, yeah, I do have those still out there. So close all the credit cards you, you don't have. Make sure there's nothing out there you don't know about. And shred paperwork. Do you guys shred your paperwork or at least? Yeah. Some of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so um, credit cards that come in the mail, even if you're not interested, you cut them up mm -hmm. in the applications. Yeah. Any questions about scams? Do you have your PowerPoint in written form? Um, just a printout like this printout. that I could give you guys. Like that. That's perfect, sure. Okay, yep, I can make some more copies of that. Thank you. Yep, and then we went over some of the stuff, like the telephone scams, the lottery, and the grandparent one. And then this is kind of a tricky one too. So they send this and they say, we want you to be a secret shopper. Have you guys heard of this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna pay you to go in and be a secret shopper. And these are the items that you're gonna buy and that you're gonna send to us. Oh, and give me your banking information so I can pay you. Hmm, okay. Or we'll send you this check for $2,330. And you can keep you know, 1,500 of it as your fee, right, for being my secret shopper. Just make sure you send me back the, the difference because I accidentally overpaid you. Because people do that a lot, right? Accidentally overpay. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of different red flags if you're looking for it. The scams that you've got in Oshkosh, have you caught any big scams in Oshkosh here? Um, it's just <laughs> these types of things that people get, but it's hard. So say somebody falls for it, right? And they go and buy iTunes, and then they call this person back and give them all the information. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to track down that suspect because they might be in a different country. What? Different country? So the biggest thing for us to be able to fight these is to catch it before it happens. Because once it happens and you wire money somewhere, what are the chances of getting that back? So education is kind of the key to this, just getting it out there. Any other questions about? Is it, is the number of these going up or about the same or going down? I'd say maybe going up because I'm, I keep getting phone I mean, they just keep trying over and over, just looking for people to fall for it. Because, you know, what else are they doing? They're just sitting at the phone, call, 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 call. And if I get one person to fall for it each day, that could be a good paycheck for not having to do very much. I'm not paranoid, but what I do is with my phone, if I don't recognize the number, I don't even pick up. And more often than not, when I look it up on whitepages.com, it will say that it is a scam, fraud, something other than a legitimate call. So I've got more numbers blocked in my phone almost than I do regular Mine numbers. Too. Yep, and then if you see, they'll just change a number too, mm -hmm. right? If you see the phone, right. then, then oh, they change one or two numbers. Yeah, or if you try to call them back, it'll just go to a dial phone. 
One thing you may want to add is the computer scam. You know, we're from Microsoft and we noticed a problem in your computer. Yes. And would you please do this or that? Don't press R. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how do you know it's Microsoft? Sure. I don't know, now you're going to give somebody access to your computer where you maybe do all your banking on? Mm, that's not good. That's why I pay for computer support. Yeah. And really, there, there are some good local businesses that provide that computer support, the virus scan, the whole bit. And they have the capability of dialing in and making whatever changes need to be done to your computer, but they do it with your consent because they, you have to give them a code to allow it. Double check everything that's nice if it's local. You can go down to the store and do it mm -hmm. in person. Okay, should we move on to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Have you guys heard of Project Lifesaver or Take Me Home program that we're doing? Both are fairly new, both a little bit different though. So Project Lifesaver, our mission is to find missing people and find them quickly. So you probably all know that the first 24 hours of somebody going missing is very crucial. Especially if we're in Wisconsin and it's winter time and they leave without shoes on or a coat on, this really is a high alert emergency. We need to find that person and find them quickly. And also, I've noticed through various studies that people with Alzheimer's and dementia will not really take the most direct path. If they have an idea of where they want to go, it's very different from what we would do. So if we're walking somewhere and, and we see a body of water, we're going to walk around it. Well, they might not. and They'll try to walk through it. Or um, lots of thorny bushes or whatnot, they will just try to walk through it where we would walk around it. So. It becomes a very life-threatening situation when people go missing. So for this, we have reached out to the community. So if you live with somebody that you are with you know, all the time, so you're gonna notice if they go missing quickly, then you can call us and they have little bands that they will wear. So if my husband is wearing a band, say, yep, uh, I just got back, he's been missing for about an hour, I can't find him, then we would be able to go through our database as long as he signed up ahead of time, plug in the frequency on our equipment, and then try to go and locate him. So we need to know the last known place that they were seen, and we can put the equipment up on the squad car so that we can get a little bit more distance and then we just have to listen really carefully for a beeping noise. So once we think we know the direction, then we can take it and do a handheld, and we'll walk around and try to find that beeping noise. And it works pretty well. We've had one, and I think we located them within 30 minutes. So it's a really great tool to have. So that's the transmitter, that little box on the left, and that goes on a wristband. And then the receiver is what we use. And these little pieces here will expand out. And that's what we use as our meter to read. That looks different, but it works. Hey, what's your range on that? How close do you have to be um, to I'd hear those beeps? To, yeah, I'd have to look at the specific parameters of it, but I know that you can change modes so like when we put it up on the squad car, we can have a longer range, and then when we get closer, we can dial it down. So we're constantly adjusting it, trying to find that beep. And it's challenging, because yeah. we have to get certified on these to be able to use them. So they, okay, um, you got 15 minutes, ready, go. Go out and find this. So they would have the little transmitter buried somewhere. So yeah, it works really well though. So that's, it's hard to see, but it's just a little wristband. <coughs> just goes on, and then each month, we have to come and change the battery out of it and test it to make sure that it's going well. And then the caretaker or whoever lives with them just needs to make sure that the person keeps it on. Some people will try to take it off. 
Now that's strictly the city limits of Oshkosh or does that cover Winnebago County if um, in it general? depends on if the agency is doing it. So we are kind of the mother agency of this program. So we will help train the different departments and Sergeant Raggy is in charge of the Oshkosh Police Department one. So I'm not sure which other jurisdictions have joined us in this project yet. Okay. But it's very simple for other agencies to kind of jump aboard our program since we will go out and teach them how to use it. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys heard of the Take Me Home program? So a little bit different. So this is for maybe someone who is nonverbal, maybe uh, autistic or some other type of disability possibly where they can't identify themselves. They may have a tendency to wander or they might have behavior that looks different than maybe what we're used to. So if somebody's yelling and screaming and we come upon a scene and we don't know this person, okay, I'm not really sure what's going on. They're obviously upset. They can't communicate with us though. We need to figure out who this is, how we can help them, if we need to get them home or how can we assist them. So, and it's nice too when we find kids maybe that have a tendency of wandering, because we had that happen, that we can go in, as long as they signed up ahead of time, go into our database and put in some of their physical characteristics and then it will pop up different names. So if I find a little boy, you know, I'm probably five years old, maybe put in like four to eight years old, brown hair, white male, located in this location, and it should pop up a couple of different names. So then we can start to call parents and contact information. It just helps us identify these people quicker. Who signs up the five-year-old? <laughs> the parents should, yep. And then we will notice stuff too. So we have a child now that has a tendency of wandering and he is autistic and he lives by some railroad tracks and he has left the house and we've come upon him several times. So if that happens, we will reach out to the family and be like, hey, we really should sign him up for this project. And we can put the picture on there and all the information. So if I say I'm, I work usually night shift, but I'm working overtime on day shift, I'm not familiar with this family, then I can, if I find this child, I can just you know start to query information and locate the parents quicker. Does the child wear some sort of ID on this program? They do not. They do not at all. No. Okay. The other area where that's very valuable are, and I see it, a couple of my neighbors that should have it, in the ones who have advancing dementia, and they know their name, but they can't give you their address, things like that. Or uh, folks with particular health issues that when the paramedics are called, as neighbors, we don't necessarily know what the health issues are, but we know that they're in trouble. And again, having that on record. And I don't just mean in my apartment building, I mean out in the community itself. Yep, any additional information helps us to help people quicker. It really does. So some really good tools that will assist us and I think assist people in the community as well. This is a totally voluntary program though, right? It is. So, I mean, if, if Judy wanted to refer some of her neighbors, uh, is there any process for that? Uh, I mean, do you do any outreach to people that uh, may be a little, a little reluctant to be part of this, some, something like this? Or, we'll reach out you know to the saying? spouses or the yeah. children or the children to say, hey, these are the programs that are out there, and then it's up to them if they want to sign up for it. The Take Me Home program is a lot easier because it's not something that you have to really maintain. Like when you do that with the wristband, you have to change the battery every month. And we do it. We have a list that will alert us yeah. saying you have to go and change the battery, but then we're coming to your house, we're coming in and changing the battery, which sometimes that can be intrusive, you know, depending on what the person is dealing with too, that might be hard. So yeah, just to, all voluntary. But if we do have a case, I mean, these are the first things that I'm talking about with the spouse or the caretaker. 
say, hey, you know, I really think this could be beneficial to you guys. You generally get a positive response then? They say, well, based on what we just experienced, let's sign up right now, or what's what kind sometimes. of... Sometimes. Sometimes, otherwise, uh, this will never happen again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's nice that we have these two programs available to offer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Also with Take Me Home, um, do you ever have anyone say, I'll give you a photograph also? Because years ago, there was a, a program that was started in one of the other communities that uh, was supposed to be a registry that could be with the police and fire department. You had the photo and all the information. Yeah. And then it sort of went by the wayside. You know, but that's just it's stuff that you have to keep up with. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if we're signing up kids and the parents need to contact us to update information if they move or update photos, too, so that it's current. So it's definitely a partnership that we have with the community. Going back to the scam, what's the telephone number people would call to report a scam? There really isn't one. I mean, if, if you wanted to send me an email or call me, you can so that I know what's happening. So if I get 10 phone calls saying, hey, this is what's going on, I'm like, oh, maybe I should put something out on Facebook and say this is the newest way that they're trying to get people's money. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for her? For Project Lifesaver, how do they go about signing up for that? Just call the police department or? Yep. And ask okay. for Sergeant Todd Raggi. He works okay. the Asia Patrol and he's in charge of it. Is there a cost associated with that? There is, but I know that there are donations out there too. So I think that they work on a one-on-one -on -one basis to try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Project Lifesaver goes a step beyond the um, the wander guards, which are the alarm goes off at the door, but once they're out the door, there's no tracking that ind individual down. And so, I personally, um, a number of years ago, that would have been very helpful in the case of my own dad, who had a habit of walking away from a facility, had the wander guard, and then walked away in the middle of the night, and it was quite a period of time before, at least in my estimation at the time, uh, before anybody was started looking for him, let alone when he was found. And that was the middle of the night in a snowstorm. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much a proponent for this, not an opponent. Um, and I definitely have been telling people about it any, any chance I get. Yeah, it helps us save lives. It when you talk that first person, I live in, in the neighborhood from where he walked away. And I, unbeknownst to me, that we'd had the police and the dogs and everything searching our neighborhood, and he was found much further northwest of where we were. And uh, then I saw the newscast right after that that he was signed up for the program and that he had walked away again. But the, he was found right away, or in a very short period of time. So it speaks volumes for the value of the program. You hope you never have to have the police called out for it, but it's really good to have in case you do. Yeah, it just helps us to find them so quickly. I mean, versus just searching in how many different places. I mean, that's just really hard to do. And so if we can at least have that beacon and follow it, because if you once you listen to it, that chirp will will lead you right to the the thing. It's very impressive. It's an amazing tool. Are these programs uh, available and appropriate for people who are in uh, assisted living facilities like CBRFs or nursing homes as well? Because we, they tend to maybe walk away from those facilities on occasion too. I think you would have to look at the facility and then each yeah. individual person and what their history is too. So if it's right. a locked facility where you have right. staffing 24-7 and it's a very small likelihood that someone can get out <clears throat> unnoticed too, um, then maybe not. But I mean, if you're living at a house, just the two of you, and you know that they have a tendency to wander, but you're going to notice quickly, you know, that they've been missing and you can report it. So it just depends on each different situation, but possibly, yeah. 
could be considered under certain circumstances, in other yeah. words, yeah. yeah. Okay. It would be an enhancement to the uh, wander guard or all the other alarms that are used. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Helpful. Oh, Kate, you were going to talk about the drug box. Oh, yes. Um, have you guys heard of the drug drop box that mm -hmm. we have over at the police department? So it's a really nice, uh, another tool that people can use. So if you have unwanted medication at your house versus throwing it away or flushing it down the toilet, um, bring it to the police department, put it in the drop box. It's what color? What? What color is it? Red. Yep. So it's right by the entrance to the lobby of the police department. And then we will empty that and sort all the drugs for proper disposal. So it makes for a healthier community and it gets unwanted drugs out of your house. If you have a lot of, say, narcotics laying around your house from a past surgery that you don't use, that, that could make you a target for a burglary. You know, just get all that stuff out of the house. And you know, if you have small kids that are in your house too, it prevents them from getting into the medication accidentally too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if mm -hmm. you would like to leave or if you'd like to stay, that's your choice. <laughs> Same with you, Jean. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Want to do the uh, printouts? Just give them to Bobby Joe or so on, and we can get them from her. Right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. People probably could be referred to our our uh, video of this meeting too, right? And, and get the um, the, the right. And as things move along, we will have our Facebook page and our page on the web city website. But that's coming yet. <laughs> <coughs> okay, we'll go through our old business, our committee reports. Um, strength, oh. Strengthening our partnership with neighborhood associations and other partners, Lorton. I went and talked again with Pam Ruder. Uh, Pam is the coordinator for the neighborhood associations. I think there's 16 of them now. And uh, shared with her the information that Dr. John Newman gave us about the Take Me Home and the Lifesaver and the Senior Camera Program. And also, uh, Judy, you gave me the video of the meeting and I dropped that off. And she's going to show that to the representatives of the various neighborhoods and if they want they could take a copy of that and show it at their own neighborhood meetings. When Pam meets basically just with the representatives, not with the neighborhoods per se. And I think we could do the same with, with this meeting. Okay. okay. Um. Improving access to affordable transportation and delivery services for seniors. Uh, I was notified that uh, the health department and Aaron, correct me, health department and who is doing the transportation meeting at the end of the month? At the end of the month? Probably. I don't know. I, I had the notes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, there, there's a a meeting uh, September 27th at 10.15 to? 11.15. Okay. Fox Thank Valley you. Thrives is, the, okay. uh, is yeah. the group you're talking about. Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. And Ron and I will be attending that. Uh, anyone else can. It's uh, dealing with transportation for seniors, how they're actually getting around the community. Uh, and it will be in the Willow Room at uh, the Senior Center. Um, Claude, did you have anything? The only thing I want to say, this is in a, uh, our paper here, the bus services and that kind of stuff, too, is going to bring up. And, and that's what we're going to transportation is about, right? Okay. Also, like you said, let's talk about transportation. So I'm interested in this because we've been talking about this thing now for a long time, trying to get transportation, get everybody from A, a B, C, back and forth at home, and it's kind of hard to do. I know in my neighborhood, I always talk about my neighborhood. I used to have a bus go by my house when I was younger. 
Now I'm getting older. It used to be on Mount Vernon that went to Maine. Now it's over on Jackson Street. So if I gotta walk three blocks to get to, or three and a half blocks, I don't know if I can make it anymore, you know. So I'm just trying to think that, isn't there any way that there's any kind of a, uh, grants that are given out for uh, transportation for, uh, for bus more bus services or anything? There are grants that are out there, but they also look at what is the ridership does it warrant adding extra stops? Does it warrant adding an extra route? If there's not enough traffic generated, they're not going to go ahead and do that. So the reason I asked that question for, this sounds kind of goofy and I tell you this, but I, I, I was reading something in the paper, like on weekends in Oshkosh, to go from tavern to tavern, they got organization, a grant money supposed to be set up for to get to call to go from one place to another place. And they can't have a grant money set up for the older people to go from the doctor's office to the uh, grocery store or, or someplace else. And that's what I'm getting at. There's got to be some kind of money somewhere because it seems like there's always a little money hidden in the closet someplace. The one on the weekend you're talking about is funded by the Tavern League. I know, I know. I, but also I understand they got some extra money, though, because they got some nice, beautiful buses they drive around in because I know we have a bus in my neighborhood. And they call up and they go from one place to another. But they got these other new fancy buses. They're supposed to be only opened up on, on Fridays and Saturdays. So I'm, I just, and I've seen them already. But I'm trying to figure out there's something better for transportation. Like Judy and I and Peggy, we've been trying to transportation for, I say for years, trying to find things out more easier. And we just can't seem to hit the right button, you know, but I will come, I'm going to go to this meeting, even if I go and get a little five minutes out of it, I'm going to go because I'm, I always look, try to learn something from meetings. I was always told by my boss, you, you go to a meeting, you might not enjoy it, but if you get one thing out of it, it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do with you, Judy. Okay, thank you. Uh, creating community design and policy that supports an age-friendly community. Jean? Yeah, I just want to make everyone aware that if there's mm -hmm. any situation or problem regarding any ordinances or anything in your neighborhoods um, to kind of funnel those questions to us so that we can help individuals or people in the community. Um, there's nothing that has really come across my desk at all lately, but um, if there is, uh, hopefully we can get those answers for everybody. Okay, thank you. Sure. Improving communication and visibility of available services to seniors. Billy, did you have anything? I don't have anything today. Okay, Sue? Oh, I just had some uh, things that maybe not fit in here, but just some things health-wise that have come across my desk here. <laughs> um, first of all, um, kudos to uh, Wisconsin, um, our state of Wisconsin Department of Health Services because out of um, 2,000 health departments across the nation, um, there's only 200 that have reached the level that they have. They received a national accreditation. So um, we have to give them a lot of credit for even applying because it's a rigorous process and they actually got it. So we have a very good yeah. state health department and you know they're out there trying to help us with our health, water, clean air, a lot of immunizations. They do a lot you know, to try to keep a person healthy. And where are they located? Well, the state is in Madison. This this was a state oh, okay. award accreditation. Okay, mm. yeah, it's our state health department basically, and so 200 out of 3,000 have that accreditation. So that's really um, really a good thing. Mm -hmm. They should be pleased about that. <clears throat> the other thing is um, we had uh, the first case of West Nile virus. Um, reported this last month in May and uh, well the first bird tested positive in May that always happens early in the spring it's usually usually a raven <laughs> anyway now um, yeah there is actually a person that has been identified um, as of August 17th that had West Nile virus now the majority of people and that is from mosquito bites so you know be aware 
you know, the, wa the air is yeah. getting cooler now, so mosquitoes aren't quite as bad as they maybe were when it was hot and humid, but they're still out there. And um, if you get West Nile virus, nine out of 10 people wouldn't even know they had it. Um, because you just, and then some people that are affected would get like symptoms of um, maybe a fever, maybe uh, body aches, almost like they're getting the flu or something, but it, it just goes away. It doesn't, but rarely, like this one person that was recently identified in Dane County, um, she got very ill. So just try and protect yourself against mosquito bites. It's really important. And to do that, most things have to have a little bit of DEET in them, you know. Some people stay away from that, but sometimes, you know, when you're in the deep woods or in an area where you really need protection, you probably do need to use some with DEET. And um, with all the standing water we're going to have now for a while, <laughs> it could yeah, be a little bit of a problem around here with mosquitoes. I noticed that in the along the frontage road there on, uh, yeah, Washburn, they're really pretty high. Yeah. Um, let's see, the other thing here we had is, um, well, Erin, do you want to speak at all to the, um, what they're doing for prevention? Now I saw some signs along the road for, um, opioid prevention. Do you want to speak to that? this weekend there's going to be a... Erin, you want to move up to one of the microphones? Well, I can't. <laughs> and then you can just stay there for the rest of the okay. meeting. I, I think, um, I don't have specifics on it, but there is going to be an opioid kind of run this weekend. It's September 8th. And so they're going to be doing that. I, I think it's to, a, you know, just raise awareness of addictions and um, bring people together for that awareness. Um, we still have our evidence-based classes that are going well. So I, I spoke on that at the last <laughs> meeting. Okay. Well, it looks like they're kind of doing some town hall meetings, the community events yeah, as well. Yeah, they probably do. Yeah. You know, because yeah. they were awarded this grant money, so they need to use it in various ways. And mm -hmm. because we already have, you know, a drug box, and we don't have to have take back days like they do still in, like, Dane County. They don't have a drug box there. So we are very fortunate from the Fox Valley all the way from... Green Bay to Fond du Lac, we have 24-hour drug drop boxes that you can drop it off. People have even put things like, um, you know, <clears throat> pipes in there and weed and things like that. The other thing that's come to our attention is that, um, you know, the fake weed that you oh, can yeah. get out there, um, people are starting to have serious bleeding side effects from that because they've laced it with uh, rat poison. So the rat poison is okay. Yeah. yeah, so there's always something new on the horizon with that that you have to be aware of and so, you know, it's not a good thing. Yeah. So uh let's see, do I have anything else here? There was something here on justice in aging. Uh oh, they're talking about getting dental care for Medicare people that some people, because they maybe go to the hospital or they're in an accident or what have you, if it's a dental problem, Medicare doesn't touch that. So they are looking into covering that for people with Medicare, which would be a very nice thing because, you know, dental, as you know, is probably the most <laughs> expensive thing you can pay for if you need to have their services. So they are looking into some kind of coverage for that through Medicare. So that might take a while to uh, get pushed through, but they are considering it, which is, that's a plus. So. Ron? Yeah, I have a couple of updates. Uh, one has to do with uh, the new Medicare uh, cards. Uh, you should have gotten your card already if you're on Medicare. <coughs> uh, now, the, now the issue is if you didn't get your card and you live in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, um, then you maybe need to do something about that. Uh, if you haven't gotten it, you should uh, remember that your new Medicare card will come in a plain white envelope from the Department of Health and Human Services. So that's what you should be looking for. Um, and if the card didn't arrive, you should call 1-800-MEDICARE 
uh, or call the uh, <coughs> uh, uh, center representatives. They, they can check the status and help you get your new card. So uh, you would take the initiative, 1-800-MEDICARE, because uh, you should have gotten your card by now. Uh, in the meantime, use your current, your old Medicare card, if you will. Uh, that will get you the service that you need. Um, another has to do with uh, credit freezes. Um, September 21st will be the, the first day you can get a free credit freeze uh, from Experian, uh, TransUnion, or uh, um, what's the other one? Equifax. Equifax, that's it, yep. And uh, currently, uh, some states charge, I think Wisconsin does, like $10 per freeze, and I think there's a charge also to have it unfrozen and freeze again. Uh, so um, this is legislation that uh, is changing things as of the 21st of this month. And also you can get a fraud alert extended from what is currently a 90-day fraud alert to a one-year time frame. So a couple of uh, positive things for consumers there. Uh, another is the Real ID compliant driver's license. Now these are going to be required if you're going to be flying or uh, going into public build, federal buildings that is uh, uh, after October 1st, 2020. So there's a little time frame here, but uh, the point here is that uh, your Wisconsin Department of Motor Vehicles will issue the real ID without any additional charge to you uh, if you are doing that as part of a renewal process up until that time. And if you're trying to get a real ID outside of that time period, you're going to pay an extra fee for it. So um, for those of you who travel uh, or uh, have some business in federal buildings, that sort of thing, uh, this is part of the Real ID Act of 2005 that said that by 2020, October, people will have to have that kind of identification in order to... In addition to your driver's license with correct. the picture? Uh, well, this will actually replace that. Uh, if you can renew it at the time of your renewal now, between now and, and 2020, uh, you can actually get a new uh, real ID compliant driver's license. And you'll be able to tell that it has a, um, an emblem on it, a mark on it. It's a, it's a black circle with a white star in the middle. That's how you'll identify a compliant uh, Got your old uh, ID. Okay. It also requires additional documentation oh. before you can get your right. new license. Right. You really need to go and it in. It needs to be certified copies, not just yeah. um, like the uh, with a marriage license when the name has been changed. Not not just your normal copy that you get from the church or or anything. It has to be the certified copy that's been you know recorded with the state. And they won't just send it to you because you say, well, send me the, the real ID kind when you're renewing your driver's license. You need to take some additional steps, provide some additional information, like a passport or whatever, as you apply for your renewal. But that's the best time to do it because there's no additional charge. <laughs> Give us the dates again. Uh, October 1, 2020 is when uh, you would need that kind of ID in order to travel by air. But before then, you can do it any time? Before you, well, bef up till that time, you certainly, with Wisconsin DMV, you can uh, get the real ID driver's license at the time you renew. When does yours but expire? Mine expires next summer, so I'm, I'm good be, with that. That'd be Mine the time to do it. 24, 2024. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, just uh, something to be alert to. Um, I wonder if <coughs> when you're getting renewed now, they'll probably be sending you some information about this as you go through that renewal process to give you that option. I don't know. Uh, I've not been through that as yet. Uh, just an update on money follows the person. We've been talking about that at, at previous meetings. That's uh, funding that would uh, allow a person on medical assistance in a uh, nursing home to go back into their own home or other, other uh less restrictive facility and get uh, their medical assistance funding for home and community-based waiver programs. Uh, they're having uh, um, hearings uh, at the House Energy and Commerce Committee tomorrow. 
in, in DC, and then uh, uh, the following day, uh, this Empower Care Act is what it's called. Uh, we'll be uh, doing a, uh, another <coughs> briefing for the legislature. They're trying to get the funding extended. Uh, it's already terminated as of uh, 2016 uh, when uh, it terminated uh, through the Affordable Care Act and they're trying to get it extended to allow for more people to be uh, have that option of returning home from nursing care. So um, that's in the works and uh, hopefully that'll get funded. <clears throat> and the final thing is uh, disaster fraud hotline. Plenty of disasters going on around the, the country and uh, uh, this has to do with uh, uh, alerting members of the public that to keep a critical eye out and do their due diligence before trusting anyone purporting to be working on behalf of disaster victims and, and before giving contributions to anyone soliciting donations uh, on behalf of disaster victims as well as being extremely cautious before providing personal identifying or financial information to anyone, especially those who may have uh, you may be contacted uh, after a, a disaster. And there's, like I said, there's disasters all over and solicitations don't, uh, aren't limited to those areas where the disasters occurred. So this is the National Center for Disaster Fraud uh, hotline. It's 866-720-5721. Uh, that is 866-720-5721. Um, and they s give some examples of uh, disaster fraud complaints. Um, they can both be from a natural or man-made disasters. Some of those examples are impersonating a federal law enforcement official, ID theft, identity theft, uh, fraudulent submissions of claims to insurance companies and the federal government, uh, fraudulent activity related to solicitations for donations of charitable getting, of giving, uh, fraudulent activity related to individuals and organizations promising high investment returns from profits from recovery and cleanup efforts, uh, price gouging, contractor fraud, uh, debris removal fraud, and theft, looting, and other violent crimes. So um, report fraud to this National Center for Disaster Fraud hotline. Uh, again, it's 866-720-5721. And this is from uh, 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 our own Wisconsin, uh, Greater Wisconsin Area Aging Resources Center in Madison. So just uh, be alert and as Kate was talking about, don't give out any of your private information unless you've initiated the contact yourself. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, under other business, we have the Brain Fitness Fair uh, coming up next week, Jean? Uh, I'd like to um, invite all of you to come to the uh, Brain Fitness Fair at the Senior Center. It's on Wednesday, September 12th from 10 to 1. We'll have uh, Jane Wells, our program supervisor, has been working with uh, the Valley VNA to co-sponsor this event. Uh, this is the second year of this event. There will be uh, interactive uh, vendors all throughout the center in the South Building. And then our keynote speaker will be Dr. Kazell. She'll talk about ways to prolong the onset of dementia. And you need to register for the event if you are participating in the lunch. Uh, we do have a uh, free lunch. Tickets are, I do believe, going fast. So you need to contact the center probably today to find out how many tickets are left. And we ask that um, if you stay for lunch, that you stay for the presenter also. You can also come and listen to the presenter without coming for lunch too. So um, a fun day, uh, 10 to 1 again, and the um, lunch is at 11.30. What day is that again? September 1? Wednesday, September 12th, next oh, Wednesday. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as was stated earlier, we will be having a space at the expo and so we'll have um, Ann Schaefer working with us on a display piece. And also, you've just reviewed the city website, correct, and changes for the Senior Center, things like that? 
Correct. They're uh, asking all the di the different departments to start to review what is already out there, and then um, Anne is t collecting all of that information, and then she'll go back to the individuals who are with the city to uh, look at how they're going to put materials back into the newly created website that they will have. I don't have a timeline on that, um, but your uh, Committee on Aging will be under like the boards and commission area so that people can just click on the um, Committee on Aging right from the boards and commissions for the city. Thank you. So again, backtracking to the Senior Expo, we'll have that display space and Ron and I plan to be there, and I'm sure, Julie, you're going to be there with Bella Vista. Correct, I will be. Um, but we would invite any of the members of our committee to come and participate. We have our meeting that morning, so we'll be going, those of us that are participating over there will be going from this meeting to the convention center to participate for the rest of the day. Um, so anybody that's interested in um, helping to staff our space, make sure that you let me know, and we'll work accordingly. Any other business? Then I'll take a motion to adjourn. If we have to, I move. Second. <laughs> okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.